All right, everybody online, uh, welcome to the afternoon session of Cyber uh, Tech and Risk Security Automation Conference. And our next speaker is already there. So I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Tasin Shabab, co-founder and CEO at Panfield.ai. Tasin co-founded Panfield.ai in 2017. And uh, previously, Tassin was a cybersecurity consultant uh, uh, driving major deployments and the best practices for companies like IBM, Royal Bank of Canada, a Global Telecom, and then more. And Tassin will talk about an interesting topic, enabling the next frontier of automation in cybersecurity. I'm sure you will learn a lot from Tassin's presentation. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me here at this uh, conference. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm one of the co-founders at Penfield.ai. I, a little bit about myself, I graduated from the University of Waterloo in electrical engineering. And since then, I've been in cybersecurity for the past eight years. I've been a cybersecurity consultant for companies such as IBM, Royal Bank of Canada, a Fortune 60 telco in the US, a North American government and more. And during my early days, I also have a, a an engineering and a, and a software development background. I was one of the lead developers of applic application security cloud solution called AppScan Source on Cloud, which was top three on Gartner's Magic Quadrant in 2014. So uh, without further ado, we'll start off our uh, discussion. So today we're speaking about a topic which is of uh, which I'm deeply passionate about, which is enabling the next frontier of automation in cyber. So moving on. So around 2016, there was a belief that AI will automate everything in cybersecurity. We have heard this at conferences. We have heard this. We have read about this at industry white papers and more. But fast forward 2022, we have seen a lot of interesting activities in the market. One of which would be the M and A market in cyber. We all know uh, Google in January of 2022 acquired the SOAR platform Simplify for around $500 million. In addition, just after a few months, Google acquired the renowned uh, MDR, uh, Mandian, for around $5.4 billion. Now, this is an interesting shift in dynamic because why would Google, a company which is blessed with some of the best AI scientists in the world, a company which has un almost near unlimited compute, a company with almost as much data as you can imagine, along with some of the most advanced cyber tools in the market, including Zero Trust, require the acquisition of a five point of a of an MDR or a services company for five point four billion. So let's explore the message um, in the box bottle. So the interesting thing about AI is as follows. So AI is great at automating simple static processes. And one application of this is uh, image recognition, which you see on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand image, you notice an image classifier was able to accurately classify objects such as a car, a bicycle, or a person. Now, the interesting thing about these objects are these are simple objects, which means the features or the patterns which we need to recognize in order to identify a car or a bicycle doesn't change over time. So this is more static um, object recognition. But cybersecurity is a different field where everything keeps on changing. First, your ad attack patterns keep on changing as hackers constantly look for the path of least resistance, always changing their maneuvers. Next, our network patterns keep on changing as we onboard new technology. An example could be, for instance, we're adding more services on the cloud or we're onboarding new software, both of which would impact our network patterns. And finally, our user behavior changes as we scale our organization and business. An example could be we, a company might decide to open up or on, onboard a new customer in a different uh, geographic location which would entail the sales teams sharing some documentation to a different um, location. And, and this would all, of course, change the user behavior. So none of these factors are static in nature. Everything keeps on changing. To further aggravate that problem is the follows. Um, 
the machine learning models have been dem like hack scientists have demonstrated that it's quite simple to bypass existing machine learning detection and here's just one example which the research community might already be aware of so on the left hand side we have an image classifier which which is able to recognize an image uh, panda with a certain degree of confidence however re researchers have identified just by adding a small amount of noise which is invisible to the human eye which is 0 0.007 of the noise you're seeing on the screen would would uh, force an image classification to misclassify a panda as a given. So the idea becomes the way in which AI learns these about these patterns are quite different than that of humans, and they're quite easy to spoof. So what is the impact of all these constraints? Well, the impact is as follows. A lot of the tasks require human intervention. And here is just one example. What we have done is we have looked at alerts and we have segregated alerts into two components. One is your repetitive alerts, which keep on happening over time. And second would be novel alerts. Maybe it's a new attack we've seen for the first time. Of course, with novel attacks, since the data is not there, we would need a human to understand the attack and mitigate the threat in the appropriate manner. And even for repetitive tasks, we have broken down repetitive tasks into two components. One is your simple repetitive tasks, and second is are your complex tasks. The simple repetitive, extremely simple repetitive tasks are somewhat automated today, um, and we'll dive into those in a bit. And the folk, but the core focus of this discussion would be how do we automate the complex tasks which require human intervention which is also, of course, another reason why companies such as Google are acquiring, are spending a lot of capital to onboard strong cyber staff. That being said, we'll dive into the topic of our discussion today, which is how do we enable humans to perform better with AI, which is human machine intelligence. So at a high level, human machine intelligence is a layer of intelligence which sits between the humans and the tools they use in order to ensure you can leverage the best traits of the humans along with the best traits of your tools. At a more micro level, the thesis is as follows. So with human machine intelligence, you can um, extract data from the different tools used within cybersecurity it could be your sim tools sort tools and as well as your itsm tools and the idea becomes in addition to capturing incident level data which are data pertaining to attacks and the metadata associated with those attacks we also infuse that with the analyst interaction data what are the actions taken by analysts to resolve these issues. And with this, we can build certain knowledge to automate complex tasks, which I'll demonstrate in a bit with some sanitized results. But first, let's dive into the following. Let's, let's talk about how we have traditionally approached automation with SOAR tools, security orchestration and automated response tools. So at a high level, the inception of SOAR was as follows. During the early days, there was a lot of logs and the idea was how do we analyze these logs, which is why we worked on SIM platforms. Initially, the SIM platforms were based on more simplistic or legacy architecture, which is your Hadoop clusters. And then we realized that there was a bottleneck in aggregating data from all different types of solutions in near real time. And which is why we, we looked at the next generation SIM tools, which are more cloud-based. But then even with that, we realized the following. Even with, of course, a more efficient way to aggregate different logs and alerts, there was a lot of burden which was thrown to the analysts. So analysts were bombarded with more tasks, which leads to burnout, stress, as well as fatigue. So that's where this notion of SOAR came in, which is a bolt on on top of SIM tools, which enables humans to automate certain simplistic processes with workflow diagrams. So this is the low code, no code approach to automation where you can drag and drop certain boxes which would connect to different tools and you can automate certain uh, processes. Now, this is great for automating simple static processes, but there, there, there is a big gap in the industry, which is as follows. So today, even if companies have sort tools, the gap is identifying the accurate processes which are ripe for automation. And, and I'll share this in a bit. So we, we work with a number of organizations that we've noticed a number of companies have sort tools, which they, which are extremely sophisticated sort tools, which have been lying around for one and a half years, but only probably five or six 
playbooks have been created, which are quite simplistic in nature. And I'll share why this is the case. First is the following. It's hard to identify the processes which can be automated because the best analysts often rely on intuition to solve problems. And here's a, a brief extract from a book by Daniel Kahneman, who's the Nobel Award winning author from his book, Noise. And this is and his exp explanation is as follows. So when analysts solve problems, there's a mass, a lot of information uh, which could be inconsistent in nature. So analysts have to focus on different bits and pieces of information and they have to stitch that information together. And then they have to ask certain questions to decipher the meaning. And all the this uh, salient decisions are not recorded anywhere, in which case people can off the top of their head, it's very hard for these analysts to identify what are the exact decisions they made in order to come to a conclusion, which also leads to poor documentation and poor playbook building. To further aggravate that situation, the following constraint exists in, in the industry. So the processes analysts use to solve problems are dependent on the context. And here's an example. So within a bank, the same attack on your online banking server would be dealt with completely differently than that of your reward server. And this is due to a number of reasons. These servers could have different technology stacks, they could have different business criticalities, uh, different policies and more. So even the same attack is not solved the same way within the same organization. And you can imagine for an MSSP or MDR who could be responsible to deflect attacks across hundreds of companies across different industry verticals, this problem is even uh, worse. In, in addition to this, an interesting point is when analysts solve problems, they, they usually take an iterative, iterative step, uh, step to solve problems. So usually analysts ask a series of questions and answers which they can deduce from tools and based on the response from these tools, they'll update their strategy to understand the problem and to mitigate the problem. So this is not a linear approach. There's a lot of back and forth which the analysts would have to go through across different tools to come to the right conclusion. So in summary, thus far, we haven't been able to automate the more complex tasks using SOAR tools because humans, it's very hard for humans to understand what are the processes that can be automated to begin with. And here's the impact, business impact of that. So since it's hard for humans to know which process to automate, the onboarding time of SOAR tools are quite long and also it leads to poor return on investment. Today, in order to build a playbook in an enterprise setting, humans have to go through quite a number of steps, which is first, an analyst might have to identify the use case, uh, then they, they, would, they would have to build the uh, process logic and they need to ensure the integrations are built out and then they have to test it in a limited setting and maybe within a business unit and then across different business units to ensure that the playbook scales and then of course you have to deploy it and then you also have to maintain that uh, process and this is why of course uh, we haven't reached the full promise of automation as of yet and this is where where um, human machine intelligence comes into the picture. On the right-hand side, we notice a process which was surfaced by human machine intelligence, and this it was done as, as follows. So human machine intel intelligence keep track of the actions taken by analysts to solve problems. And with this, you're able to automate the surfacing of these accurate processes which are ripe for automation. And then you can throw it to, uh, pass it over to an analyst or a SOC engineer who can build out the automation using their existing SOAR. And the business value is evident, in which case you reduce the, the workload of humans to solve repetitive problems as those uh, many of which can, can be automated. Moving on to the next slide. So diving deeper into how this works. So at a, at a high level, as I've mentioned, human machine intelligence keep track of the actions taken by analysts across different tools. And these data points are mapped with the context of the alert. So you'll have a certain kind of attack would be cross-site scripting, you have metadata associated with that. And then we build these rich blueprints. And these rich blueprints take into account what was the output from certain tools and based on that what was the decision made by the human and then we can map it from from the beginning till the end in which case over time you can build these rich decision maps which which many of which can be automated moving on to the next slide so this sounds all great but then there's 
a big pitfall why which is why it's very hard to implement implement uh, or discover these processes in a live setting and this it this is due to the following reasons the reason is as follows human human um, analysts being human make mistakes and analysts make mistakes due to a number of reasons could be due to skill gaps due to stress fatigue lack of uh, contextual knowledge and more so in essence many times the analyst interaction data tends to be quite noisy and if not treated in the right fashion the processes we will discover might not be accurate which might uh, uh, which would definitely impact the business and this problem is is present today due to the following reason so when you look at even some of the most sophisticated cyber operation centers humans are still reliant on random spot checks to perform the QA. So a few ex the, uh, traits we have noticed is as follows. One is within certain organizations, uh, a SOC manager might randomly select incidents out of a pool of completed tasks for review. So it's random selection, many times mistakes go undetected till there's a breach or an external audit, uh, both of which are costly. There have been other settings where companies might have a QA uh, team, in which case if the QA team is not reviewing each and every task they're doing a random uh, sampling in which case again mistakes often go undetected and and worse there's no feedback loop around that accuracy which can be used to train humans and more and this is where uh, automated qa can be beneficial with the help of um, uh, human machine intelligence and, and the idea is as follows so with human machine intelligence you can have a live feed where every time an analyst resolves an incident you can perform a series of computation to identify the likelihood of a mistake and imagine a prioritized live feed as demonstrated on the right hand side where you have a list of uh, alerts which have, should be QA validated um, and, and which would de-risk the organization from um, uh, like a, an impact. So some of those could be a breach, it could be you know issues with compliance, could be issues with external audit, it could be customer churn, should it be an MSSP MDR and more. And so to this mechanism, you're able to automate 100% of QA for closed events. And I'll share how that's done in the next couple of slides. Next, moving on. So the idea is as follows with regards to automated Q QA. So whenever incidents come in, you have analysts who are using different tools to solve problems. But with human machine intelligence, we can monitor the processes taken by humans. And then we can look at deviances from the norm in your process and look at a high likelihood of mistakes. And that can be flagged for immediate review. And the reason for that deviation can be pinpointed so that the QA analyst is not spending time uh, randomly selecting um, alerts for for QA and second they don't have to do go through the entire investigation process because the potential mistake would be identified on the spot. This sounds all great, but last year uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, in his book Noise mentioned the following thing. So even Daniel Kahneman from his research states that it is best to focus on the process of a judgment rather than the outcome if you want to identify the quality of human judgment in a complex setting where the ground truth is not available, which also means many times in cybersecurity, we're solving new problems and we don't know if, what the right data point is. Um, an example of that would be, say, in weather forecasting, we can forecast today i can mention that tomorrow it's going to snow and we can verify that tomorrow because you can check reality with the prediction but in cyber often those data points don't exist in other many other settings too that those data points don't exist in which case looking at process deviance according to even daniel kahneman is is the right approach to address that and we have seen this in in the live world as well so here's a sanitized result and what we have noticed is as follows we we observe how one analyst solved one attack or one alert across one customer ID within an MSSP for a certain duration of time. We notice over a span of a few days, this analyst solved that same problem three times. And what we did was we looked at the actions taken by the analyst across different tools. Right now, of course, this is a simplistic view where a ticket got created, ticket got assigned to an analyst and the analyst opened up a number of tools. And right now we're just demonstrating abuse IPDB. And based on the response of the tool, the analyst performed a number of steps and then the analyst closed the task for a certain reason. And what we did was just by automating the QA process, we, we were able to uncover for some reason, the specific analyst escalated the same problem 
by going through the same chain of command during the third iteration. And this was flagged for a QA review. And this was quite exciting for our end customer as well, because they didn't have to go through each and every task and manually uh, perform a QA. All of this would be surfaced and brought to the right person's attention so that we can address that. In addition, automating the QA process has another advantage, which is as follows. So today within SOX, we have poor visibility into skill sets. Our analysts are graded based on time and frequency. The analyst who solves the problem fastest and quick and does the most number and completes the most number of alerts is your best analyst. But unfortunately, this mechanism is flawed. And this and here is why. So this mechanism is flawed because analysts are not rewarded for doing a diligent job. So what if I'm an analyst and I want to do a diligent job? I want to go through all the right steps. I want to maybe, maybe I identified an anomaly and I want to dive deeper into the problem. Unfortunately, that behavior is not rewarded in the industry today. This also means that many times analysts are leaving their jobs, they're not satisfied, their job progression is impacted as well, um, which leads eventually leads to churn. And what we have noticed is as following, as follows with human uh, machine intelligence, of course, by factoring in not only just time frequency, we also can include the accuracy component as well and, and a number of other factors. And based on that, we can accurately model the skill sets of humans uh, within our organization. And here's one example. On the left hand side, we see a skill set heat map where on the X axis, we have different tools. These also could be different kinds of attack categories for the purpose of this example, we just pick different tools. And on the Y axis, we have different analysts who are addressing these problems. We noticed on the top left corner, Jaya has higher skill sets across almost all categories. Um, or has sufficient skill sets across all categories, but has a stronger skill set for, say, Office 365 um, and, and other tools. And now this view, and of course, the white blank area on the lower right corner depicts skill gaps within the organization. Now, once we shared this kind of data points to SOC managers, it becomes quite interesting because now they can, this enables a few things, one of which would be enabling strategic skill-based um, scheduling. So for instance, what, if, what happens if GIA is not present during like for a certain session, it would also mean that maybe your other analysts might not have sufficient tools to really decipher information within say cloud trail, which, which is a skill gap. So that's one. In addition, this view also enables soft managers to perform more strategic training because all of a sudden we can train the right resources and give them the right uh, training material so that they're focusing on the right tasks to upskill and to, uh, the analysts and to benefit the organization. In, in addition with this, we're also able to enable um, SOC managers to perform strategic hiring as well, because all of a sudden, you know the skill gaps within your organization, you can uh, go up to management and kind of command that, um, that budget required to address real gaps within the organization. In addition to that, once we understand the skill sets of humans uh, and the processes they follow in real time, we can perform further optimization. And one of which is skill-based task assignment. So today we've demonstrated we can reduce the skill sets, uh, we can reduce the mean time to resolve incidents by up to 25% just by assigning tasks in a strategic manner to the right analyst to solve problems. This is quite exciting because of the follow. So first is by giving the right analyst the right task, they, they, they have better skill sets so, so they can do a more diligent task. And many times with complex attacks, of course, you have the cyber kill chain. Uh, many times the right, many times different analysts might have different viewpoints of the same attack chain. So giving it to the right analyst means that they have a complete picture to address it. In addition to, of course, the MTTR gains, which leads to improved productivity, but it can, it can also de-risk customers from a breach and their existing calculations from Forrester to, uh, to go through that. So in summary, I wanted to talk about human uh, machine intelligence. So we're a cybersecurity company uh, based out of Toronto and with human machine intelligence, Penfuel is the first to model the skill sets of cybersecurity analysts in real time and 
we do this by observing the analyst interaction data. And with this, we're able to automate a number of processes to improve the speed and accuracy of cyber attack resolution. So we would be happy to address any questions. And if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me at thescene at penfield.ai. But I'll open up the floor for questions at this point. Awesome, so it sounds like there are a few questions. So first is how long will it take a SOC to adopt human machine intelligence mode? So, so that's a great question. So from our deployments, what we have noticed is as follows. So as when we do a deployment, we usually request access to certain tools and we can deploy Penfield in Kubernetes within your own cluster. And with this, we can we initially observe two to three weeks of uh, data, which enables us to solve the cold start problem to demonstrate significant efficacy in an offline setting. And we usually uh, demonstrate those results to stakeholders to get their buy-in and immediately we perform a deployment. So in summary, we, we can look at two to three weeks worth of historic data from your existing tools. And it usually takes us two weeks to start, get to a position where we can start going live. So the second question is, what is the best way to make a security analyst job ready for a modern SOC? So I think um, that's a great question. I think the important one way to an, uh, respond to that question would be, what are the important tasks within the modern SOC which analysts need to work on because cybersecurity is a massive field. You have application security, network security, malware detection, reverse engineering, just uh, like whole gamut of different skill sets which are required. Um, so what I would recommend is the following is first identifying what are the tasks analysts would need to perform. What we have noticed is as follows. So of course you have, um, um, in cybersecurity, you have scenario-based training, which is uh, great. You have industry best practices, which analysts can uh, learn. But the reality here is within your SOC, we could be using different tools within our, we could have different processes within our organization. So how do you train analysts to solve the job within our organization? And what we have been doing is as follows. So as part of some of our deployments, we were able to reduce the onboarding time of analysts from eight weeks down to four to five weeks. And what we do is we first do the following. So we can, we can um, first train analysts by looking at the best characteristics of your best analysts, because with human machine intelligence, you can map the different processes your best analysts take, and you can then train analysts through on the job recommendation. So that's one element. In addition, what if your new analyst makes a mistake? That's where you have the intelligent QA, whereby you strategically assign certain tasks to your analyst. You can kind of guide them through the process with AI recommendations. And finally, every time an anal the new analyst solves a problem, you can do the immediate QA spot check so that should there be a potential mistake, a more senior analyst can re review it to ensure you're not putting your SOC at risk. So is this, uh, human machine intelligence can help in, in that regard. And we have uh, demonstrated that. Uh, thus far. So should anyone have any questions, by all means, please feel free to uh, reach out. Happy to uh, continue the discussions. Th thank you very much.